1 Timothy, 3rd chapter, verse 8. Deacons, and this is going to go from 8 to 13. This is the content, the context of what we're after. Verses 8 through 13, deacons. Deacon likewise. Here's what's missing. In verse 8, we have the word likewise. That word likewise means that he's talk, everything he's talked about, look at verse 2. The overseer then, that's the, that's the pastor of a congregation who has the gift of teacher. The overseer. And so there's a discussion on the overseer, verse 1 through 7. Then he comes to the deacon and says, likewise. This is an ordination position. Just like the pa pastor is an ordination position. Okay? You have to be ordained to hold the office as pastor teacher. You have to be ordained to hold the office of deacon. Likewise. Now, notice something interesting. Look at verse 11. This whole subject, verse 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, is all about deacon. The word deacon is found in every verse in the Greek language, either translated deacon or servant or service, in every verse but 11. So verse 11 is contextually part of the office of, of deacon. And he refers to women. Look at verse 11. Women must likewise. Same word. He's not talking about women. He's talking about a deacon's wife. If he's married, we have qualifications that's connected with his wife. Okay? Okay? This is why you attend this church. It's important we pick that stuff up. When we ordain deacons to our church, we qualify their wife as well as them, yet we only ordain them because they hold the position. But a wife is a very important asset, not only to the pastor whose wife is examined, but also the deacon's wife. This is the deacon's wife. And she can disqualify the deacon from holding office. So, here's how this passage. Deacons, likewise, must be men of dignity, not double-tongued or addicted to much wine or fond of sordid gain. But holding to the mysteries of the faith with a clear conscience, let these also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. This should not be translated women. It should be translated wives. It was translated wives in verse 2 in regard to the pastor. The same word is used in verse 11. It is referring to wives, and it's referring to wives of pastors. If a pastor is married, if, if a pastor is married, his wife is under consideration. If a deacon is married, his wife is under consideration. We, women or wives must likewise be dignified. Now, wait, wait a minute. Watch this now. Where's that word used in verse 8? See the word? Look at verse 8. Deacons, deacons, likewise, must be men of dignity. The wives of deacons must likewise be women of dignity, wives of dignity, or women of di dignity. Do you understand that? All right. Here's what could disqualify her, and here's what could qualify her. Disqualifications, not malicious gossips, positive, but temperate, and faithful in all things. Here's verse 12. Let deacons, back to the subject, let deacons be husbands of only one wife, 
that's properly married or properly remarried. And good managers of their children and good and means and good managers of their own household. For those who have served well as deacons, here's the promise, for those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a high standing not only within the church, but within the churches of Jesus Christ, obtain for themselves a high standing and great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. So we're going to look at this. Here's how you qualify a deacon and his wife. If he's married, then his wife is under consideration as well because they're a team. I work with my deacons and their wife as teams. We don't always meet because it's, but we, but we meet quite a bit with husbands and wives because we know something. Just this passage encourages it. And we know husbands go home and the wives are there. If their prayer partner is going to pray about the things that was discussed, and we expect the wives to be part of that system and keep things in confidence. When the husband goes home and the wife is not able to attend, often we bring the wives in in attendance to these meetings. And you see one of the negatives of her, she cannot be a what? A gossiper. You can't have her go... To, I mean, often we talk about things in the church that should not be talked out. As boards of deacons, we have to do examinations on charges and all kinds of things. And uh, so we work them as a team. And we try to be sure that they understand that principle. So let's look. There are six areas of examination. There are 12 qualifications. And watch this. There are five disqualifications. So when you're examining, when you're thinking, well, I think I'll select somebody, pay attention to what qualifies them and what disqualifies them and about the wife. There are some things that qualify her and there's some things that disqualify her. Now, look, I, I don't want to hear, I, I, I've been in church all my life, I've never heard this. I haven't said anything that's not in the scriptures. I... I I don't, I, no, I can't explain why you don't know any of this, right? So my job is to make sure my people that are under my teaching understand this. We want to have, and listen, we, you look at that list of people, we've had some pretty honorable people and uh, some good men. Now, Here's the first area, spiritual personal qualifications, men of dignity. Now, if this person winds up with 12, 12 qualifications and his wife, he's called a man of dignity. A man of dignity, semnos, uh, a man of character within the church, a man of character. Uh, here's what this word dignity means. S Seriously minded about the ministry of the church. You don't have to convince this man to come to Bible study. You don't have to convince this man to live by faith. You don't have to convince this man that he should be a spiritual person. 724 is in the house, out of the house, in the church, away from the church. He's supposed to be a man of dignity. These 12 qualifications is going to set him apart. The two qualifications of the wife is going to set her apart. And they as a team are not only going to bring uh, honor and dignity to this church, but to other churches that are connected with us. That's really important. Now here, here are the negatives. The knots. This man should not be double-tongued. This is a reference to a pattern of sins of the tongues like gossip, slandering, backbiting, etc. Can be somebody tells you one thing and does another. 
does it behind your back. Okay? Uh, Lone Ranger had a sidekick, Tonto. And he always talked about a forked tongue. Kimasabi. A forked tongue. That's this guy. Not addicted to much wine refers to a pattern, a pattern in his life of alcohol and drugs that would be an abuse. I've given you passages that are well worth your time on your own. I'm limited, but this would be good resource material for you to study. Not fond of sordid gain. This refers to a concept, a pattern in their life of greed or covetousness. Sometimes you can't see it. it. It has to do with not just money matters, but materialistic ideas of their life because we walk by faith, not by sight. A good example of this guy that sometimes can be hard to see by other people unless you've had dealings with him is Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot in John, the 12th chapter, was a, was a secret thief among the disciples. The Bible says he pilfered, he pilfered the box, the, the money. He, skin, he, he, he skimmed off the top. He, he took a little here and a little there that would be noticed and could cover it. I don't knowledge of a know of the 44 years I've been pastor here we've ever had that problem because we always try to have safety nets with it. But when I worked for the Billy Graham organization, ran into it a lot among pastors. When I say a lot, I don't mean every, cru every crusader, every meeting we had, uh, whatever evangelistic effort we had, you had it. But I mean... You don't have to have it a couple of times. You, you get re really leery. And so this shady dealing can be part of that, shady dealing. In second qualification, hey, I want to tell you something. Verse 8 and 9 is one Greek sentence. That's important. 8 and 9 is one Greek sentence because it picks up my second one, spiritual growth qualifications. It says that he should be a person who holds to the mystery of the faith. You know what? Mystery is just another code word for church-age doctrines. This guy is into church-age doctrines. He, he believes there's a, distinct, this, a real distinction between old covenant beliefs and new covenant beliefs, and the church is to operate under new, new covenant beliefs. He holds to that view is important. Uh, and so in practicality of his life, he's a person that actually lives by walking by faith and not by sight. But the biggest distinction here, he understands there's a difference between old covenant doctrines and new covenant doctrines, that the church age is a distinct a dispensational idea theologically. The other, the other aspect, it says that he holds to a clear conscience. This word clear may not be sufficient enough for us to understand. It is the word cleansed, a cleansed conscience. This is often translated pure, this Greek word pure or clean, clear. Okay? Okay. But the only way you can have one is to have it cleansed. Now, the word of God will cleanse it, and the blood of Christ will cleanse it. Uh, refers to a consistency in his life of understanding the principle of walking by faith. The second consistency is walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, not the flesh. This man has got to understand the Christian life and the life of the church 
is live by walking by faith and not by sight and walking in the power of the Holy Spirit and not in the flesh. And he's got to be a guy who understands that principle and puts it at the best of his ability in the practice of his life because that is the life of the church. He must hold to this concept not only in theology or, or in theory, but actually in his practical everyday life, the 724s of his life, life at his home with his family as well as his church. You say, well, this may be more than I know. Well, you're supposed to write down people that you know are qualified or disqualified, right? What are you, who are you examining? Okay, all right. It's obvious that if you only attend once in a while, you're not going to know these people. Okay? So there's two, two more things added to that. What's kind of interesting, that in these two verses, 8 and 9, there's a main verb. The main verb, if you look at verse 8, the main verb... 3.8 is probably going to be italicized in your Bible. Must be. It's deo. It's D-E-O. Now, that's a Greek word, not Latin. Okay? I'm talking about the Greek word deo. And the Greek word deo is translated um, must be in verse 8. Deacons, likewise, must be men of dignity, and then goes into qualifications. This is how we know they are men of dignity. The, they qualified. The qualifications of these men are men's, men of dignity. They must be men of dignity, and you've got to qualify them in order for you to understand these men are men of dignity. Do you understand that? Uh, okay. So the third thing, and I give you scripture for that. The third spiritual is spiritual testing qualifications. He says first, they must first be tested. Listen, this is not, listen to me now, this is not about the, this is not about the examination or the ordination. They must be people from among your group who have been spiritually tested and have passed their test. There's nobody in this room that has spent more than a year in the Word of God that hasn't been tested. The word of God is what's tested. And you, you walked it out in faith. You walked it out in the power of the Holy Spirit, not by sight nor, nor in the flesh. Men, men who have been tested, gone through undeserved suffering for Christ, people who have, who have been tested. Men who have already been tested, not men who are going through the examination. Men who have already been tested. Tested spiritually. Dokimazo means tested and approved. These are people you know that have had some real, really tough things in their life or have gone through some struggles, like all Christians do, uh, in undeserved suffering, have come out the other, other side of this thing, um, and you applaud them. Because let me tell you, when you become a deacon and a wife and become a team part of us, you have a big target on your back called the angelic conflict. And I tell you this ahead of time, uh, you, like the rest of us, you will get hit because you're a deacon. You will get hit because you're a pastor. You're a teacher. You're, listen, you're going to get hit too because you're a, a person who sets in doctrinal teaching uh, for self-growth, spiritual growth within yourself and uh, the dynamics of your gift and the dynamics of your Christian life impact in the world in which you live. I mean, the devil, see, you know, the devil seeks those out whom he can devour. You know, that First Peter 5.8. So this, this person needs somebody. It, and here's what this means. It can't be a novice believer. This has got to be a believer that has some 
uh, identity in the consistency of the word of God in their life. The taking in, the inhale, exhale. There's got to be some example of that because of 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And as a deacon, he's going to walk into it. He, he can't ride the bench. You cannot, as a deacon, you're a player. You're not, you're not a spectator. You're not a pew warmer. You're a player. And... pastor's going to ask you a lot of stuff. He's going to have all kinds of visions. He's going to have everything. And he wants things. And a good example of this move from here to Moody. It's rock this little boat. It's rock this little boat called Doctrinal Studies Church. And people go like, well, I'm not going. I'm not going to do this. I'm not. Well, it depends on why you come. If I did that, I wouldn't be pastor a week. If I based it on who comes and who doesn't come, whether well, they're not coming anymore, I'm not going to pass this church. Listen, I'd have, been, I'd have been dead fish the first year I was pastor, let alone 44 years later. People come and go. Why do you come to this church? It's why it's important to go where we're going. Well, I don't know why you come to this church. We'll see. If it's the word of God, if it's about a building, you don't know anything about my ministry because my ministry has never been about a building. It's been about people. It's been about people. I can't tell you how many people have told me what I should do, Ron. You're a great teacher. What you should do is just shut it down and, and, and go to the Internet go to the internet I have 4,000 people a month on the internet I don't care about 4,000 people I care about 40 who come set I'm a face to face guy I want to look you in the eyeballs I want to tell you the truth I, I care about you I care about your relationship with Christ. No meet anybody. I've never met one person on the internet. I don't mind the ministry, but that's not who I am. I wouldn't ever shut down my ministry to go to an internet. That's not who I am. I'd die with my boots on before people. Not before some screen. I'm just from a whole different generation. I'm not saying I don't know what's right and what's wrong about it. I just know for Ron Adema, okay? It, I only know for me. For me, listen, I'd rather sit with one person having a cup of coffee talking about Jesus than 4,000 people out on that. I blow smoke in my face, and I don't know anything about it. Well, anyhow. Not a, so when I, when I get to this point tested, it, it's, we're not talking about a new convert, which is mentioned in the third chapter 6 and 7, towards a pastor, you don't, put a, you don't put a pastor in it, you don't put a deacon who is a new convert. He's got to have some season on him. He's got to have some season in the word of God on him because he's going to get some hits. It just goes with the territory. Because I get them. When you're identified with me, you get them. I get them because I'm identified with Christ, and he gets them. And so it goes. Listen, not a new convert, but must be above reproach. The word must be is interesting. It's I me. I me is an absolute status quo verb of existence in the present tense. He must be and always be this man. He must be above reproach. Above reproach. People going to be charges against you? And when they're run out, the charges can't be proved. He's a man above reproach.
Now, people still bring charges. They, they bring all kinds of stuff against you. Can't be proved. And that's one of the jobs of the, de- of the board of deacons. One of their jobs is to run all that stuff down. He must be above reproach, watch this, to serve. There's the verbal form of the word deacon, and it's an imperative. Notice I put it on your paper, it is a command. Notice the word tested is a command. There are two commands in that verse. When it says he must first be tested, that's a command, and must be above reproach, that's a command, and those two things go together. Four, the spiritual qualifications of the wife. The word woman is gune. It's used in verse 2 and verse 12 in context of a deacon. This is not a woman. This is the deacon's wife. I tell you, another proof of it, there's no verb in that sentence. This is a Greek sentence without a verb. Think about that. This is a Greek sentence without a verb. And it is the only sentence in which the word deacon is not used. This is not referring to a deaconess. It's referring to the deacon's wife. This is not a different category in the midst of a category. Look, Paul's a smart writer. In verses 1 through 6, or 1 through 7, he talks about the pastor the qualifications of a pastor. In verses 8 through 13, he talks about the qualifications of a deacon. If he wanted to talk about the qualifications of a third category, he'd have made a third category. Paul is the smartest one of all of us. He's smarter than all of us put together. He didn't do that. And Paul knows how to do that. He's a master at doing that. He didn't do it. He didn't do it because you shouldn't do it. It's not talking about deaconess. He's talking about verse 2 and 12. He's talking about the pastor of the wife in verse 2. He's talking about the pastor of the deacon's wife in verse 11. There's so much evidence of it, I can't begin to tell you that. I just told you a lot of it. <laughs> talking about the wife. And he's a negative on her is she must not be a malicious gossiper. Let me tell you, well, I don't need to tell you how bad that would be. You talk about leaks in the White House. You can't have leaks in the church. You cannot have deacons. When you're talking about personal matters within a congregation, you cannot have gossip leaking. Can't do that. This is not a sign to the man. It's a sign to the wife. Even if she doesn't attend, the wife and the husband goes home and explain to her some of the things that go on for prayer. She... You know that you know where they zip your lip and throw the key away. That's what we're talking about. You can't have a tight lip a deacon and a loose lip wife. Now, if there's one group of people in this church would know if you got that is you women. You talk all the time. I probably wouldn't know this. But you gals know. You know who's loose lipped. You, if you want something known, you tell them, right? If you want other people to know, you got, you, everybody's got that person you tell if you want everybody to know it, right? Well, anyhow. Not malicious gossipers, sins of the tongue. But listen, here are two qualifications, temperate and faithful. Temperate refers to not being overindulgent in the flesh of the sin nature like the tongue, whether it be temperate, whether it be alcohol, drugs, food, or exercise. You wouldn't think that would be in there, would you? 
I didn't either until I got hooked on exercising. And God had to pull me off from it because I got addicted to endorphins. I ran until my tongue fell out. Waiting for a fix that I didn't understand. And God showed me that three miles was better than 12. So I quit at 12 and I went back to three because it was just exercise. Faithful in all things pertaining to the church affairs along with her deacon husbands in marriage. Faithful in all things. Number five, the spiritual qualification regarding the husband as, a, as the deacon, as a husband and a father or family, verse 12. He's the husband of one wife. The word be in that verse is an imperative. It's aimi, absolute status quo. And it's used for three things. He must be the husband of one. He must be a good manager. He must be a good manager. It's an imperative. This is an imperative. This is a very strong characteristic that it must have. A husband must be the husband of one wife, refers to properly married and biblically remarried. A good manager of their children refers to, refers to his leading ability, his ability to lead his children in the Lord and in the church. A good manager of their own household refers to being able to lead, the, to, to lead in the affairs of his household without being neglectful of the priorities of his life and time and needs. Not only does he need to have that exercised with his children who are under his roof or authority, but he needs to have that exercise in him so that he can do it in the church. Isn't it interesting that the preliminary for a good deacon is how he manages his wife and his children because that's the way he'll manage the church because the church is compared to, to his marriage and the church, to Christ and the church, and, and God is the father of the family, right? So you look for that. Good managers, good leadership ability, because what we're looking for is leadership ability in the church family. That's what we're looking for. A good manager. Notice there's a command on all those three principles. Be a husband of, be a husband of one wife. And I explained that. Here's my final point. Spiritual rewards. Because of ordination... The pastor teacher is told that if you'll be a faithful pastor teacher, there, is, there are rewards for you in eternity. The crown section, in the crown section. This guy is told the deacon, because of his ordination held responsibility in the church, if he serves honorably as a deacon of the church, he will obtain for himself or themselves a high standing referring to spiritual reputation among the churches of Jesus Christ and will obtain for himself great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus, referring to the influence within the churches of Jesus Christ. And for that, he gets honored at the judgment seat of Christ. He gets honored as an ordained man, as a team player, in the leadership of the local church along with the pastor. That's a high honor. You may not realize it today. You just may think it's a lot of work. And it is. But there's high honor in it. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you have raised up honorable men throughout our 44 years here. And we have an honorable board today. They're wonderful men. Wonderfully selected and men who 
are in the process of obtaining an honorable name of deacon within the brotherhood of deacons throughout the Christian churches of the world. And I am thankful for that. And their wives. And their wives. They were wonderfully picked. I, I look for that fourth man to add to our team now. And his wife, if married. And children, if they have them. To be brought into this nucleus of honorable people. And as we make our transition from Roebuck to Moody, we, we're excited about this transition of moving a ministry to a community of clear evangelism and doctrinal growth out of milk and meat. Bring us that person, Father, that could elevate responsibility, take on responsibility give the confidence of the people as they examine these people and think about them and pray over them the man that the man or men that we need for we've made our prayer in Jesus name, amen